So this class and every class that we do this term is going to be recorded and the recording is going to be posted to the Brightspace course either later that night or the following morning along with the PowerPoint slides that we use. So I encourage you to take notes during our meeting and to ask questions but if you miss something or if there's something that you think oh I'd really like to review that later just remember that you'll always be able to go back to the recording and have the PowerPoint slides um, the next day at the latest. Well welcome guys to our Math 130 course. My name is Jennifer Turner and I am your instructor. I have worked at SNHU for a number of years and I have been teaching Math 130 for a long time so I am very familiar with this course and the students who take this course and the um, the different questions you guys have and how you guys feel about the course and math and everything else. So I welcome you and I'm very glad that you could attend tonight so we could get a kickoff for the term that we're starting 19EW3. So <clears throat> excuse me. the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We're going to go through a little PowerPoint slide where first we're going to do an introduction to the course in general and talk about some things you need to know as far as the platforms we're using and the websites we're using and the resources we're using and then we're going to jump into a quick review of the week one material and then we'll um, end with your questions and anything else that you'd like to share with us. So if you'll give me just one moment here I will go ahead and stop sharing this and I will share my screen with you. Okay, can everyone see my screen? It should look like the same PowerPoint slide that we were looking at a minute ago. Excellent. So what I'm going to do, you guys, is I'm going to minimize the chat box so I might not be able to see your responses for a little while. If you would be so kind as to please hold on to your questions because we're going to cover a couple different things about the course first and then I will pause to take questions. So if you have a question, please write it down. Hopefully I'll answer it later in the presentation, but if I don't, for sure we will pause for questions at that time. Since I'll have the chat minimized, I won't be able to see your question and I don't want to miss it. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize that. So all of this information that you're looking at is posted in Brightspace, but just so you know, again, that is my name, my email address, my phone number. So you are welcome to contact me um, through my email or my phone number. You can text my phone number if you need to, and you can also contact me through the Remind app if you signed up for that. If you didn't sign up for the Remind app or if you don't know what that is, that is a nice little app on your phone that will send you a text message reminder when assignments are due or things like that. So it's a nice thing to sign up for if you'd like that extra reminder on top of everything else. So this is what we're going to do today. First we're going to do an introduction to the class. We're going to talk really quick about the areas to focus on in Brightspace in my math lab. We're going to talk about some resources that are available to help you. We're going to talk about some tips that I'm going to give you for how to be successful in class. And then we're going to do a quick review of the week one material. So in Brightspace, there's a couple different places that I want you to really focus on. The first, just this week, is going to be the Start Here box. So the Start Here box is where you should always start in your course, right? It's right there in the name. And the reason you want to look there is because it has all this important stuff that you really need to know before you start class. In particular, the syllabus is very important. Please review the syllabus, print it out, so that you know exactly what the course contains, what all the assignments are, how you are graded, and basically everything you need to know in order to know how the course will proceed for you. Um, next, there is an overview of the course, which is similar, but just sort of a little shorter overview of what you're going to be doing in this course and what to expect. And lastly, there is a rubric which applies to only our week one discussion board. So in this class, we only have one discussion board that is graded, and that is the week one board that is labeled 1-1 one, one getting started. That's the introduction board where you're just going to introduce yourself to me and to the class. After that, all the discussion boards are optional. However, I highly recommend that you do participate in them because we can work together in those boards to ask and answer questions, 
to talk about how you're doing in class, and I'll show you in a minute. I always post some resources in the discussion boards each week that should help you out. The next place in Brightspace that you want to focus on are the module folders. So for each week we go through, there will be a folder for module one, module two, etc. And that's the place where you can go to really find out what we're doing that week. There will be a quick overview of the material we're going to do that week. And then there will be some resources posted for that week. And then lastly, it will tell you what your assignments are for that week. So make sure you always go to that week's tab in Brightspace for whatever module we are on. And the last one that I really want you guys to check out is the Academic Support tab. This is a great one because it will link you to online tutoring. SNHU has a really great feature where we have tutors available for you online, totally free. And you can access that through that Academic Support tab. So I know a lot of people really like that extra help. Oh, I'm sorry if you can hear my phone ringing in the background. Um, so that's the place to get it. That's the place where you can access also the tutor workshops and some various other resources at the online math community. So this is a great place to find extra help. The next place we're going to be working is in My Math Lab. I hope that everyone has signed up for My Math Lab already. If not, all you need to do is go into Brightspace and click on the tab that says My Math Lab. Once you do that, you will see a bunch of different links to different places in My Math Lab. The first one I want you to click on is the one that says My Math Lab All Assignments. Hopefully this is self-explanatory. All of your assignments, meaning your homework assignments and your exams, are going to be through this link and they are all completed in My Math Lab. The next place you want to look is your My Math Lab Gradebook. Now be careful with this gradebook. This gradebook is going to store the grades that you have in My Math Lab, but it is not your official gradebook. Your official gradebook is in Brightspace. So you can always check My Math Lab to see what grades you have. However, your final grade is pulling from the gradebook in Brightspace. My Math Lab syncs their gradebook with your gradebook in Brightspace about every 20 to 30 minutes. So what happens a lot of the time is you'll be working on an assignment, you finished it, you got 100%, you're all excited, and you jump over to your Brightspace gradebook and you see that it says you have a C or something. And then you panic and then um, get in touch with me wondering why your grade is inaccurate. So that's just because the grades have not linked up yet. If you wait about maybe uh, 20 or 30 minutes, you should be able to see that accurate grade. I just saw uh, something in the chat saying someone cannot hear me. Can the rest of you still hear me? Okay, let me just type a reply to Janet. Janet, oh, Janet, are you back online now? Okay, great. So let's see, where were we? Oh yes, so your, your grade book is going to take about 20 minutes to sync. So never panic if you see an F when you think you should have an A. Just give it those 30 minutes and the grade should be updated. If you've ever waited a while and it's like the next day and the grade still isn't accurate, then there always could be a glitch. Let me know, we'll take care of it. But I've never had that happen in all the years I've been teaching this course with um, Brightspace and my Math Lab linked. The last place I want you to look, or the next place I want you to look, is the link for the My Math Lab Multimedia Library. Under the Multimedia Library link, you can access the textbook, you can access some PowerPoints that have notes on them, and you can access a bunch of videos with short lectures on them. So this is a great place to go for some additional resources, notes, and the textbook and videos that are um, external to what's already in Brightspace. Lastly, let's talk about some resources that are available to you. Like I said, there is tutoring available, and this can be one-on-one -on -one tutoring. This is a really nice resource, you guys. A lot of schools do not have this. And the nice thing about it is you do not have to go to a campus. You don't have to do anything except log in through the link under that academic support tab. So I really encourage you to check that out right away. Even if you don't feel like you need tutoring right now, just go click on it, check it out, see how it looks so that you're already familiar with it. So later, if you feel like, hey, I think I need some help, you already know where it is and you already know how to access it. So you can just get in there and get the help that you need without having to navigate it at the same time. 
we are going to have some pre-recorded webinars posted each week. I hope that you saw that I already posted this on Monday. It's posted in the announcements, and it's also posted in our week one discussion board. Every week I'm going to post for you a pre-recorded webinar that a instructor from a prior term recorded, similar to what we're doing here, and that is available to you immediately. I highly, highly recommend watching these webinars and taking notes as you watch. They're really, really helpful, and it's a nice way to get sort of a summary of the material we're doing that was done by a another instructor who teaches Math 130, and um, students tend to find these extremely helpful. So please check those out. I also post along with that webinar a recording of a tutor workshop and occasionally other videos that will be helpful to you. So please, please never miss that post in the announcements or post in the discussion board. There are tutoring workshops like I mentioned. So there's the one-on-one -on -one tutoring, but every week the tutors are gonna have a live workshop and I really encourage you to attend. Every week in the announcements on Monday morning, I post all the live sessions that are going to be held that week. So the tutoring sessions are going to be one of them. And the link to log in to those, those workshops are going to be in that announcement. Okay, you can also find all this information on the academic support tab. Most of the time, not always, but most of the time the Math 130 workshops tend to be on Mondays, or at least that's what it's been historically. I'm not sure what it will be this term. But please make sure you check that out and attend if you can. Again, the My Math Lab Multimedia Library is a great place to find resources. I especially really encourage you to look at those videos and to look at those PowerPoints that are there. The PowerPoints especially are a nice thing that you can print that can be sort of a start to your notes, and then you can keep additional notes in conjunction with them. And again, the material posted in the announcements and the discussion boards. Please make sure you check those out every single week. Here are a few tips I'm going to give you for how to be successful in this class. Again, I have taught this class many, many times, so I really know what seems to work for students and what can really be detrimental. So please heed these warnings. Make sure your notifications are turned on. So in Brightspace, there is a way to turn on notifications, and that means that you will get an email to your SNHU email anytime I post an announcement. And I want you to make sure that is turned on because I post a lot of information to you in the announcements and if you miss it, you could miss something important. If you don't know how to set that up, just go ahead and let me know and I'll try to help you or contact your advisor and your advisor can walk you through it. So if you don't have those turned on, please do turn them on right away. I've sent you an announcement, at least one every day this week, so I hope that you've been getting those. If not, please head over to the announcement section and review all the material there. Please attend those free workshops from the Online Math Center. Again, I'm going to post recordings, but going live is really helpful because if you have a question, then you have the opportunity to ask the tutor your question right there on the spot. And you don't have to sit there confused and feeling like you're lost in the middle of the presentation where you can't ask a question. These are a really great free resource to you and I highly encourage you to attend all those workshops. Go ahead and try requesting a one-on-one -on -one tutoring appointment. Or if you don't request one because you don't feel like you need help right now, please at least go to the academic support tab and play around with it just so you know where everything is so you know how to request that appointment later if you want to. Watch those pre-recorded webinars that I just mentioned. Again, they are posted every week in the announcements and in the discussion board. Those are really, really helpful and they will really give you a great jump start to the material that you're covering for that week. Use those resources from the multimedia library. Okay, Again, those are really, really helpful. They should not be ignored. And the biggest tip I can give you guys is don't get behind. It's really hard sometimes when you get behind to catch up. We only have an eight week class, so that doesn't leave you a lot of time to get caught up, not only with what you missed, but also with the material we're doing this week. So please, please, please stay on target. So that's pretty much it for what I was gonna go over regarding the class. Really quickly, I'm just gonna go ahead and share with you a couple of pages. So the first is, this is our course in Brightspace. So as you can see, this is our home page. If you scroll right here, you'll see the first few announcements. These are the most recent announcements that have been posted. 
And if you want to see all of the announcements, you can click up here in this course menu and choose announcements and you will be directed to a page that has all the announcements available. If you want to go to the discussion boards, the optional discussion boards, you can click on discussion and you'll get transferred over to the discussion board page where you can see all the discussion boards for this term. Again, only the first one is required. The others are optional, but I will be posting resources in all of those. Let me go ahead and show you one. This is the discussion board for next week. So as you can see, I've posted you a link right here to a bunch of resources to help you in week two, and I've also posted you resources to help you with your first exam, which is going to be due on the Tuesday of week three. So please, please make sure you check those out. On this home page again, if you scroll down, you'll see all these other options that I was talking about. Here's the start here. You will not have this instructor resources. This is my account, so that part won't be there. But then you'll see the My Math Lab link, and then you'll start to see Module 1, Module 2, Module 3, and so on. So this is where everything is for you. Let me really quick show you My Math Lab. So if you clicked on this My Math Lab link, you'd be taken to a page that looks like this. There's a lot of information here, and certainly you can explore all of it. The most important are going to be My Math Lab All Assignments. Here's your My Math Lab Gradebook. And here's the My Math Lab Multimedia Library. If you click the Multimedia Library in particular, you're going to be taken to a page that looks like this. Sometimes it takes a minute, sorry. So here's the multimedia textbook. Here's some lecture videos. Here's some additional videos. And here are those PowerPoints. So you can select any of these options that you want. If you want, you can sort by a chapter or by a section. I should check chapter seven, but we don't actually do that in this class. So let's go to chapter one. And if you click find now and scroll down, you'll get all these resources. Here's all the links to the different sections of the textbook. Here's a bunch of lecture videos. Here's a bunch of different videos with maybe examples and things like that. And here are those PowerPoints I was talking about. So a lot of great resources there. Before we jump into the week one material, do you guys have any questions about the class, the assignments, Brightspace, my math lab, due dates, or anything else sort of, if you will, administrative? So guys, I'm not sure what is frozen. What is frozen? Yes, James, I will post the link to the recording and the PowerPoint slides in an announcement and in a post in the discussion board, either the same night of the webinar or at a minimum the next day. Yes, yeah, sorry, it's not frozen. I just paused here because I was looking at the chat to see if you guys had any questions. And sorry, I did stop talking for a minute because I saw you guys typing and I was just waiting for you. So um, sounds like everyone's okay. Can everyone hear me now? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Okay, great. Erica, we have two my math labs due on the due on the tenth. You have your orientation which is just to kind of walk you through my math lab and get you used to how you're going to be using it. That's, that's not too bad. That shouldn't take you too long. And then you do have your first homework assignment that is due on Sunday, this Sunday, at 11.59 p.m. Okay. I In your time zone. So it's due at 11.59 p.m. in whatever time zone you are in. Okay, 
Great, so I don't see any other questions. So let's go ahead and jump into the week one material. So we're going to go through some material, and then I'm going to um, interact with you guys a little bit as best we can and ask you some questions so we can do a little bit of practice, and then for sure we will have time for questions at the end. So week one is a lot about vocabulary. If you've already started the homework or if you've read the textbook or whatever, you'll notice we're not doing all that much math this week. We're learning a lot about terms and definitions and what different kinds of data are and things like this. We're not doing a lot of problems yet. So I highly recommend that you watch the pre-recorded webinar that's posted. Make sure you take notes as you watch that. And then if you're not already taking notes on this lecture, I would recommend taking notes and or watching the recording later. And take notes on the examples we do and all the definitions we do. And make a vocabulary sheet. Actually, I encourage this for the entire class. Even though week one is the one where we are mainly focused on vocabulary, vocabulary, having kind of a, a condensed cheat sheet, if you will, of all the major terms is really helpful because then you don't have to dig through all your notes and dig through the textbook every time you need to look up what something meant. If you have a vocabulary sheet handy all the time that you build on for the whole term, it winds up being really helpful, especially for your exams. So I would start a vocabulary sheet this week as soon as possible. So here are some of the important terms that you're going to learn this week. So the first is a population versus a sample, a parameter versus a statistic. If I'm going fast, don't worry about it. Again, this is recorded. Qualitative versus quantitative data, discrete versus continuous data, different levels of measurement, which are nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio, an observational study versus an experimental study, and different types of sampling, random sampling, stratified sampling, systematic sampling, cluster sampling, and convenience sampling. So these are the main terms that you should have on your vocabulary sheet for week one. Certainly add anything else that you find along the way and add any examples next to these that would help you keep them in mind and remember what they all mean. But these are the big hitters for this week. So let's talk about the first one. What's a population versus a sample? So basically, a population refers to the whole group you are interested in. So that's usually a pretty large group. Maybe it's the US population, or maybe it's the entire student body of SNHU. So just remember that the population refers to a whole, usually large group. Because the population is usually large, Typically, it's not possible for us to go around and get information from every single member of that population. For example, if the population is the United States, imagine if you were doing a study and you had to go out and survey every person in the United States. That would take you forever, and it would be very expensive. Right? Think about the last time the census was done. I think, I can't even remember, but the census cost like billions of dollars or something. It was bananas. So we can't do that. So in cases where we're not able to get information from everyone in the population, instead what we're going to do is take a sample. A sample just refers to a smaller group that we take from that population. So, for example, if the population that we wanted to know about was the entire U.S. population, Maybe instead of surveying everyone, we would survey 1,000 people who completed a telephone survey. Maybe if our population was the entire SNHU student body, maybe we would sample 200 students that were selected from the math program. And that is a way for us to get a gauge or a pulse of what the population is doing, but without having to survey everyone. So then let's talk about a parameter versus a statistic. Once we've gathered this data, we want to try to start understanding it. Because if we just have it sort of in its raw form, it's just a bunch of numbers or words or whatever it is, and it can be kind of disorganized. So we try to find a way to describe this data, and one way we do that is with parameters and statistics. A parameter is a measurement, so for example, the average, taken from a whole population. And a statistic is a measurement, like the average, 
taken from a sample. So these really are referring to the same kind of measurement. In both cases, my example here was an average. You could also take a percentage or whatever was appropriate for the information you were trying to learn about. The only difference is a parameter is what we call it when it came from the whole population. A statistic is what we call it when it just came from a sample. So the easy way to remember that is just by the letter that these things start with. So a parameter starts with P, and that's attributed to a population, which also starts with P. And likewise, a statistic, starting with S, comes from a sample, which also starts with S. Let's try an example. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you guys a question, and you tell me what you think the answer is in the chat. So suppose the percentage of all students on your campus who have a job is 84.9%. Do you guys think that's a parameter or a statistic? Yes, you guys got it. So that's a parameter because it's talking about the summary of a population. The key word there to clue you in that it's the entire population is where it said all students. Okay. How about this one? Suppose a sample of 250 students is obtained, and from this sample, we find that 86.4% have a job. Is that a parameter or a statistic? Yes, you guys are answering me before I even answer, ask the question. You guys got it. So this is a statistic because it came from that smaller sample of just 250 students. So next, let's talk about qualitative versus quantitative data. So when we gather data, we could have several different types. The two main categories are qualitative and quantitative. So qualitative data consists of just names or categories. So for example, maybe you went around and recorded what everyone's hair color was. Or maybe you went around and asked what their job classification was. The key here is that it's some kind of a word. It describes something. It describes an attribute. It's not a number. A quantitative type of data is data that consists of numbers, quantities, and those numbers have meaning. So for example, your age, your height, um, how many years you've been in school. It's some kind of number that has a meaning, and I understand what that meaning is numerically. So let's try a couple of examples here and see if we can figure out if they are qualitative, meaning they're like categories, or if they're quantitative, numbers. So what about a person's nationality? Do you think that's a qualitative type of data or a quantitative type of data? That one is qualitative. So a person's nationality might be, you know, American or English or whatever it is. So that is a qualitative type of data because the the answers you would get if you went up to someone and you said, please give me your nationality, and then to the next person, please give me your nationality, and they were responding to you to answer your question, they would be responding to you with a word that describes something. They would not be responding with a number. How about letter B, the number of children someone has? Is that a qualitative type of data or a quantitative type of data? It's quantitative, right? The key word is right there at the beginning, the number of children. So it's a number that you're provided. I understand that if someone has one child, that's different than if they have three children. I understand that the person with three children has two more children than the person with one child. So that's a quantitative type of data. How about household income in the previous year? Qualitative or quantitative? So household income is going to be quantitative. Again, think about it. If you asked me how much money I made in the previous year, would I respond to you with a word that describes something, or would I respond to you with a number? I would tell you a number, right? I would tell you the number of dollars that I made in the previous year. So this is quantitative data. How about the level of education you have? So that might be like the different degrees that you have or something like that. Qualitative or quantitative? If I asked someone for their level of education, would they respond to me with a number or with a word? Mm -hmm. 
yes. So that's going to be qualitative. If, I, if someone says to me they have a bachelor's degree or a high school diploma or a PhD, they're responding to me with some kind of a category or a word. They are not responding with a number. Last one. The daily intake of whole grains that you have, measured in grams. Qualitative or quantitative? It is quantitative, right? I can quantify how many grams of whole grains I took in a day. I can add up all the whole grains that I had from however many serving sizes of Cheerios I ate, and that final number is going to be just that, a number. So this is quantitative. Any questions about anything we've gone over so far about data, types of data, or any of these other terms? If you don't have a question, go ahead and just don't even type in the chat. If you have one, go ahead and start typing, and I will pause to wait for your question. Okay, I don't see any typing, so let's go ahead and keep going. So when you have quantitative data, okay, again, this next slide is only applying to quantitative data. There are two subcategories of quantitative data that you can have, discrete and continuous. So discrete data takes on only specific, quote unquote, countable values. So typically, if your data is discrete, you can go ahead and count it. So it might be the number of people in class. I can go into class and I can count, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, people. I can count those people. So that is discrete data. Also, the size of a household. I can go and say, how many people live in this house? And they can look around and say, let's see, one, two, three, four, there's four people in this house. I can count the number of people in the house. So that is discrete data. Continuous data, however, doesn't necessarily get counted in that way. Continuous data can take on any value within a range. So it might be the temperature in the room. So it could be 70 degrees in a room or it could be 71 degrees, but it could also be 70.5 degrees, right? Or it could be 70.2 degrees, or it could be 70.0015 degrees. Probably we would not have that level of precision in our temperature, but it's possible. So there's a whole continuous range of temperatures that could be achieved between 70 and 71. Whereas with the number of people in the household, I can have one person, or I can have two people, but I cannot have one and a half people, right? Another example of continuous data is the time it took to complete your homework. So it could take one hour, it could take two hours, but it could also take an hour and a half, or an hour and 15 minutes, or an hour and six minutes. So there's a whole continuous range of times between one and two hours that it could take you, or maybe it won't even take you an hour. So the question I ask myself if I'm trying to determine if data is discrete or continuous is, can I cut this in half and still have, it have meaning? So if I said, how many dogs do you own? You can have one dog or two dogs, but you cannot have one and a half dogs. That does not make sense. So that would be discrete data. If I said, how tall are you? You could say, I am 60 inches tall, or 61 inches tall, or you could be 60 and a half inches tall. So that would be continuous data. So let's try a couple examples of continuous and discrete data. The number of children you have, is that discrete data or continuous data? Janet, discrete is not necessarily finite. But, um, I mean, typically with the examples we'll be doing, it probably will be, no, but no, not necessarily. Yes, so that is discrete data. The number of children you have has to be counted, right? And we cannot have half of a child, so that is discrete data. How about household income in the previous year? Yes, that is continuous, because I could make... I could make uh, $50,000 or $51,000, but I could also make anywhere in between that, right? Even down to the cents, I can make anything in between that. So that is continuous data. How about the whole grains? Daily intake of whole grains measured in grams. Discrete or continuous? That is continuous data, because I could eat one gram or two grams, or I could have one and a half grams. You guys seem like you got it. Good job. 
So next, let's talk about the levels of measurement. This is one that tends to give students a little bit more trouble. So please do pay extra attention to this part. Take some good notes and go ahead and um, let me know later or at the end of this presentation if you have any questions. So when we have data, there's different ways that we can measure it. And these are the four main categories, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. So nominal data means the data is just names or categories, and they have no implied order. So maybe that might be somebody's hair color. So you could have blonde hair, or brown hair, or red hair, or whatever. And those are categories, so I can observe a group of people and write down who has brown hair and who has blonde hair, etc. But there's no order between them. Someone with brown hair is not higher or lower in some way than someone who has blonde hair or red hair, etc. So think of nominal as being categories with no order. Ordinal data is like nominal data in that it's categories, but it has an implied order. So an example of this might be if you're ordering a t-shirt and the sizes are small, medium, large. So those are categories, right? They're not numbers, but they have an implied order. I understand something about the relationship between these categories. I understand that small is smaller than medium and medium is smaller than large. So that would be an example of ordinal data. It's nominal data, but it has that implied order. The next is interval. So interval now is numerical data, okay? So the, the, uh, the values in the data would be numbers. And the numbers have meaning and an order. But there is no natural zero starting point. So a good example of interval data is temperature. So I understand temperature. Temperature is measured with numbers, and they have an order. I understand that 50 degrees is colder than 60 degrees. But there is no natural zero starting point. There is a zero temperature, but that is not the coldest temperature that there is, right? There are negative temperatures. So even though there is a zero there, it's not the beginning of temperature. There are temperatures on either side of that zero. So interval data is numerical data where the numbers have meaning and order, but there is no natural zero starting point. Finally, ratio data is interval data and the only difference is it does have that natural zero starting point. So going back to the household, the number of people in the household is ratio data. The response I get to that question is a number. The order has meaning. I understand that two people in the house is fewer than three people in the house. And there is a natural zero starting point. It starts at having zero people in the house and then goes up from there. It's impossible to have negative one people in the house, for example. So these are definitions I definitely want you to have on your vocabulary sheet. <clears throat> if the first few questions are a little harder to identify the differences here, don't worry, that is normal and it will get easier as you do more and more questions. This little flow chart that I have up here on the right right now is something that you might wanna print out and sort of run yourself through as you're doing these questions if you find that you're having trouble. It kind of takes you on a little series of questions where you can answer to those questions yes or no and then arrive at the appropriate type of data. So just something to add to your notes if it's helpful to you. Let's try some examples. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how about the number of snack and soft drink vending machines at a school? Do you think that's nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio data? Correct. That is ratio data. The number of vending machines is a number. I understand the order. Two vending machines is less than five vending machines is less than 10, etc. And there is a natural zero starting point. So the smallest number of vending machines I could have at school is zero vending machines. And it goes up from there. There's no such thing as having negative vending machines. Good job. How about letter B? Whether or not the school has a closed campus policy during lunch. Think about if someone walked up to you and said, do you have a closed campus policy during lunch? Think about what they would respond to you. What would that be? Nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio? It is 
nominal. So the only way you can respond to that question is with a yes or a no. So it's a category, and there is no implied order there, right? Yes and no do not have some sort of ranking that I understand. So this is nominal data. How about your class in school, meaning freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? What type of data is that? Yes, that is ordinal data. So freshman, sophomore, junior, senior are categories. However, I understand the order implied in those categories. I understand that freshman comes first, sophomore comes second, then junior, then senior. So that is ordinal data. And finally, how about the temperature on campus? Nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio? You guys got it. So that is interval data. I kind of gave that away on the last slide when I gave temperature as an example. But temperature is a series of numbers. They have order and meaning, but there is no natural zero starting point. So that is interval data. Good job. Okay, so those were about different types of data. Now let's talk about different kinds of studies. So there's two main kinds of studies that you can have. The first is observational, and the second is experimental. So in an observational study, the researcher is only observing what's going on. They are not trying to influence the results in any way. So just keep, think of it as something where the researcher is only observing. That is an observational study. On the flip side, there is an experimental study, or sometimes it's called a designed experiment. In an experimental study, the researcher is intentionally trying to change something to see what the response is to that change. A good example of experimental studies are these drug trials that you hear about. So some people will come in having some sort of ailment, and the researcher will split the people into two groups, the group who is um, receiving the drug and the group that's receiving the placebo, right? And their job, or what they're trying to do, is determine if administering that drug is having an effect on the disease. So they are influencing what's going on in the study. So that is an experimental study, whereas an observational study would be something where the researchers are hands-off, they're just observing what's going on and recording it and not influencing it in any way. So there's also different types of sampling. So we talked earlier about how from the whole population, we might need to take a small sample from that population to study it. Well, the question is, how can we do that? What is the best way to do that, and what are some of the different options? So the first and best way to gather a sample is a random sample. A random sample means there's no bias, Every sample has an equal chance of being selected. This is the ideal kind of sample when it's possible. There's also stratified sampling. Stratified sampling is when you group individuals together based on some kind of characteristic, which is called strata. And then from those groups, you select a random sample from each group. Next is systematic sampling. So that's obtained by selecting every, however many the individual from the population. So like if you lined up all the people, maybe you selected every fifth person, or every tenth person, or every hundredth person. Whatever the number is, it doesn't matter. But some way you're just going to obtain your sample by selecting the every fifth person, or every nth person. Cluster sampling is obtained by clustering the individuals in your population into groups based on like location or some other attribute. So maybe it's by where they live, or maybe it's by if they're male or female, or something like that. But you cluster together these groups based on some attribute, and then you take um, samples from there. And lastly, this is the worst kind of sampling, is convenience sampling. So convenience sampling means that you literally just went out and grabbed a sample that was convenient to you. You didn't take any real measures to make sure that it was not biased or that it was an accurate representation of the whole population. You just went out and asked the people that made it convenient for you. So these are all different types of sampling. Again, random sampling is always the ideal. Convenience sampling is typically the worst. This flowchart is from your textbook. <clears throat> and I borrowed it for these slides because I think it's a nice little visual to help you as you're going through these different types of sampling and trying to remember which is which and what the little nuances are. 
similar to the levels of measurement. Sometimes at the beginning, determining what kind of sampling you have can be a little confusing. Don't worry, it will get easier as you do more and more examples. So this is just a little visual to help you if you want to print it out to give you something to, in addition to the words, to visualize what's going on in these different sampling techniques. The last thing I wanted to do tonight, and I know we're at, oh no we're not, we still have 15 minutes. Never mind, I, I can't tell time apparently. So the random number table is something you're going to see in your homework this week. And this tends to be the thing in week one that gives students the most trouble. So this is an example of a random number table. This is another way that we do um, sampling from a group. So the question is, we're going to use this portion of the random number table. This is the random number table right here. A random number table could be generated usually with like some kind of a computer program that just generates for you some random numbers in whatever order without any, um, without any rhyme or reason to it. And then you take a list of things that you have, data in this case, these are different books, and you number them. And what you're going to do is you're going to choose your sample by taking those numbers of the different elements from your population and using the random number table to help you pick out a sample. So here, this question says, use the portion of the random number table provided to obtain a simple random sample of size 3 from this list. If you start on the left and take the first three numbers between 1 and 9, what three books would be selected from the number list? Okay, so what the heck does that mean? So let's look at this random number table that we have. So they told us to start at the left, so this is the left, right, right here, and they want us to choose the first three numbers that are between 1 and 9. So let's look at the first number on the left. The very first number there is that 2, right? Okay, so we take the number 2, and then if we look over at our book list over here on the side, number 2 was crime and punishment, right? So since 2 was the first number in our random number table, the first book we're going to pick for our sample is crime and punishment, okay? So now we got the first book. So now we did the 2, so now we're going to look at the next number in the random number table. The next number is that 4. Okay, so now we have the number 4. So we come over here to our list of books, and we see that number 4 is a tale of two cities. So the next book in our sample of size 3 is going to be a tale of two cities. So now we've done this 2, we've done this 4, so now we're going to go to the next number. So the next number is, an, again, a 4. Well, I already used 4, right? I already picked a tale of two cities. I don't want to pick it a second time. I wanted three distinct books. So I'm going to ignore th that 4 because I already picked 4. And I'm going to go to the next number. Well, the next number is 4 again. As I just said, we already picked 4. I don't want to pick 4 again, so we're going to skip that one also. Next number is 2. Well, good grief, we already picked two over here. I already picked crime and punishment. I don't want to pick two again, so I'm not going to pick that two. Finally, I get to the next distinct number, which is that eight. And if I look over here at my list, number eight is Pride and Prejudice. So Pride and Prejudice is going to be the third book from my list. Remember, the question just asks us to pick a sample of size three. So now I have three books, Crime and Punishment, A Tale of Two Cities, and Pride and Prejudice. So those three books are my random sample of size three that I got by using a random number table. Okay, you will have a random number table question in your homework. So did that example make sense? Any questions about that example? If you have a question, go ahead and type it. If you don't have a question, don't feel like you need to type, type, type no or something to the negative. Once you get the hang of it, it's actually pretty easy. It tends to be, once you get the hang of the idea, the hardest part is just sort of keeping track of where you are on the number table because sometimes they can get a little bit long. Oh, sure, Raquel. I'm glad this was helpful.
Erica, so usually we would generate a random sample of numbers from some kind of computer program. There's all kinds of programs, especially statistical ones, that will generate random numbers for you. And there's no bias in how those numbers are generated. So if we generate random numbers from a computer and then apply this technique, that's how we can get a truly random sample. Because the computer wasn't biased, so then our sample then should not be biased. Um, will this be the only form of random number table in the homework? Um, this was a smaller example just so I could fit it on the screen. The question in the homework is going to be similar. It might have more numbers or it might ask you to choose two digit numbers as opposed to one digit number, something like that, but it should be similar. Did that answer your question, Tracy? Um, it's the same format in, in the sense that it's the same basic steps. So you may not have a simple number table looking like this. You probably will have one like this, but you might also have one that has a longer number table, or it might be the numbers are in columns instead of in a row like this. But the basic steps are going to be the same. Yeah, Raquel. Um, that's the thing, guys, that Raquel just brought up that's actually um, a good point to make. Sometimes, I know a lot of us um, maybe get a little anxious about math or we feel like instinctively math is difficult or something like that. And, of course, it can be challenging like anything else. But try not to overthink things too much. I notice a lot of the time students... Um, they're, they're, they're freaking out and they're having all this trouble and I'm going, gosh, I wonder what's, what's bothering them. And then we start to talk and they were just way overthinking it. And when we go through the example, they go, that's it? That's all I had to do? And I was like, yeah, what were you doing? And, and it's like there's this, there's this predetermined, um, I don't know, stigma or something that the math you're doing has to be hard or it has to be so, you know, above your abilities or something. And usually, especially in this class, it's not the case. So if you're stuck or if you feel like something is just beyond you, take a deep breath and ask yourself, am I overthinking this? Does it need to be that difficult? And if you're not sure, you can always email me. Like I said earlier, you can always make an appointment with a tutor. I have office hours on Saturday. You can pop into my office hours and we can go over it. But when you start to get to the point that you're panicking because you're like, I just don't understand this. This is too hard. Take a deep breath and realize that you're probably or at least possibly psyching yourself out a little bit. It tends to not be that hard. You may just be missing one component that brings it all together. Okay, any more questions about the random number table? Or anything else that we covered since the last time we paused for questions? Here's the questions. Okay, I don't see any questions, so what I'm going to go ahead and do oopsies, is I'm going to stop sharing my screen.